today uh, we will further discuss the monetary approach to balance of payments. This approach as you know is about the balance of payment and it says it is that the balance of payment is a monetary phenomena. According to this approach, any balance of payment disequilibrium is a temporary phenomena. Any surplus or deficit which occurs in the short run get, gets wiped out in the long run. So, uh, let me just quickly write the equations which were relevant for the monetary approach to balance of payment. And then at the end we will see how uh, a relevant equation comes out of this uh, monetary approach to balance of payments, uh, which can be a useful equation, uh, because uh, that equation can help us to determine what are the factors which have an impact on the changes in the exchange rates. So, if you recall uh, here uh, the focus of attention is on the money market, but in the money market the demand for money which is a function of rate of interest and incomes and the prices. This is fixed because one the interest rates the domestic interest rates are related to the foreign interest rates through the open interest parity. and you further assume that there are stationary expectations. So, R is equal to R star and R star is fixed that is the foreign interest rates are fixed. So, the domestic interest rates are fixed. This is fixed, this does not change in the monetary model. Incomes are at the full employment level, it is an extension of what the classical economist thought that the income is already at the full employment level and the assumption behind it is that the wages and prices are flexible. So, the output is fixed at the full employment level and P which is a weighted average of the prices of the domestic and the imported good is a function of the exchange rate. And if you further assume that the exchange rate is fixed, you will see that prices are of are in turn fixed. So, this P which is a price index which is a weighted average of the domestic prices of the goods which are also exported plus the prices of the imported good expressed in domestic currency. And then they have uh, an important assumption relating domestic and foreign prices through the PPP theory, purchasing power parity theory, which says that the real exchange rate, real exchange rate is a reciprocal of the terms of trade. Terms of trade is price of exports by price of imports, but the real exchange rate is the price of imports divided by price of exports, this is considered to be fixed in this approach. So, this is a way of relating domestic prices with the international prices. This chapter 22 of the Feenstra and T Taylor, they go into the question why you do not see the, this happening, why are the prices quite different from the prices of the same good 
in your country and they have a whole lot of uh, reasons for that. But here they assume that this is a constant, this is the real exchange rate. So, this is constant. So, you get alpha and then pi p star pi nu So, this p which is a weighted average of the domestic and the imported prices, this is the price of the imported good expressed in domestic currency. So, this is a function of the foreign prices which is also constant, exchange rate if you assume a fixed exchange rate. So, this is like fixed this is fixed, p star is fixed, k is a constant. So, you have p which is also a constant. So, the money demand function wherein the rate of interest is fixed, income is at the full employment level and p's are fixed. So, you have a money demand function which is not changing, which is like fixed. But the equilibrium, you have a money market equilibrium wherein you will have L bar d equal to L s, this is money market equilibrium. And money supply is in the hands of the government, this is equal to h plus pi r, this is the domestic credit. these are the reserves, this is the exchange rate. So, this is the entire money supply and you have an equilibrium where money demand is equal to the money supply. So, then uh, further if you assume pi to be 1, this is h plus r. So, uh, think of uh, this as if there are changes in the high powered money, this is because uh, the government borrows, the central government borrows from the central bank, the state government borrows from the central bank, other banks borrow from the central bank and because there are changes in the foreign exchange reserves, this tend to have an impact on the money supply. So, if you go through the relevant portions in monetary economics, it will have a chapter on sources of changes in high powered money. High powered money is the central bank's money and the different sources of changes in high powered money is the domestic credit that they give to the central bank, the state, the state, the state governments, the central governments, the commercial banks and because there are changes in the foreign exchange reserves. So, then L bar d is h plus r, that is the long run equation in the monetary approach to balance of payments and see how it works. If you increase domestic credit, then there is excess supply in the money market and it is related to the other markets through the Walras law. So, if there is excess supply in the money market, there need, there has to be an excess demand in the goods and the bonds market. This excess demand in the goods and the bond market is equivalent to saying that there is a balance of payment deficit. So, in the short run, as soon as you have an increase in the money supply, you will see that 
there is a balance of payment deficit that is short run. Now, uh, when it is a fixed exchange rate and you have a net outflow of foreign exchange and if you want to maintain that foreign uh, the, the, the price of the foreign exchange, then someone has to intervene in the foreign exchange market to maintain that parity and that someone is the central bank. It has to intervene in the market to supply that much of foreign exchange, it would lose reserves, it would mean the central bank would lose reserves. So, uh, when they lose reserves, the money supply goes down. So, in the long run, whatever was the disequilibrium that existed in the money market is wiped out, because there are changes which exist, which happen in the, which happen, uh, which changes the reserves. So, you would see that eventually, uh, the balance of payment deficit is wiped out, you have a balance of payment equilibrium in the long run. This was the long run, the short run behavior was through the savings function, and here uh, you had assumed that uh, investments were 0 government expenditure was equal to the taxes, there was, a, there was a balanced budget. So, any current account surplus, a balance of payment surplus is will lead to positive savings, which would lead to an increase in reserves, when you have a fixed exchange rate regime. So, then uh, say uh, if there is an increase in the money supply, again the same point, if you increase the money supply, there will be a decline in savings. Okay. The decline in savings would mean that there is an increase in consumption expenditure, increase in expenditure on goods and bonds which is equivalent to saying that there is a balance of payment deficit. If there is a balance of payment deficit and if it is a fixed exchange rate regime, reserves will come down. So, any increase in LS will be negated in the long run. Any disequilibrium which will exist in the money market initially will be wiped out over time. So, in the long run, this will be balanced, there will be no impact on savings, there will be uh, no balance of payment disequilibrium. So, eventually any disequilibrium will be uh, taken care in the long run. Any surplus or deficit according to this approach is a temporary phenomena, it will be wiped out in the long run. So, then uh, if you further work on this equation, you will get uh, R dot to be equal to S is equal to L a lambda L bar D minus H plus R. So, you will get R dot Now, see this equation, we are trying to relate stocks with flows, R dot is equal to lambda L bar D minus H minus lambda R. So, in the last lecture, I left it at this point and then uh, I wanted to draw this, um, you know, I wanted to explain this equation through, a, through the diagram. So, I can do it here. So, on the y axis, you would have R dot or balance of payments, surplus or deficit. If it goes below 0, you would have a deficit. This would be this line. Uh, this is the equation of a straight line. You can see that you have an intercept term and you have
have the slope which is given by lambda. So, now um, if you see h h going up, if h goes up, this goes up, this intercept comes down. So, okay, so you have r dot here, you have r here. So, this is a case where h goes up. So, uh, when h goes up, that is the domestic credit going up, there is excess supply of money. Excess supply of money is equivalent to saying there is excess demand for goods, excess demand in the goods and the bond market. So, you have a balance of payment deficit. So, in the short run, if h goes up, please have a look at the balance of payment, it falls below 0, you have a balance of payment deficit. Anything above 0 is surplus, anything below 0 is deficit. But then, this is just a short run phenomena, you, when you have a balance of payment deficit and it is a, it's a case of a fixed exchange rate, the central government will start losing reserves, because it has to maintain that parity. The reserves which were say R star in the short run will, will come down and reach a level which is R double star. So, again you are back to equilibrium. You were here initially, money supply had gone up, there was excess supply in the money market, which is equivalent to saying there is excess demand in the goods and the bond market. Excess demand would mean balance of payment deficit. Deficit would mean in the fixed exchange rate regime that the reserves will come down, eventually they will reach a level which is R double star. So, any disequilibrium is a short run phenomena. Now, you can also visualize a case where L bar d increases. Remember L bar d which is a function of r y p is pi p star k, p star k constant. Say for example, there is devaluation, there is devaluation. So, devaluation of the local currency, so appreciation of the foreign currency, if pi goes up, all this is fixed, this is fixed, this is fixed, pi goes up, L bar d goes up, L bar d goes up, there is now excess demand for money, there is excess demand for money now, which is equivalent to saying that there is an increase in savings. Increase in saving is equivalent to saying that there is a decline in consumption. Decline in consumption would mean that there is a decrease in demand for goods, there is decrease in demand for bonds, which is equivalent to saying that there is a balance of payment surplus. If there is a balance of payment surplus and it is a fixed exchange rate regime, then the central bank would gain reserves. So, when the central bank gains reserves, whatever was the excess demand, this would be wiped out. Eventually, this will, this money market will come to an equilibrium and so will be, uh, the, there will be an equilibrium in the other markets, because all markets are interlinked through that Walras law, that the sum of the value of the excess demand is equal to 0. So, if L bar d goes up, this line instead of shifting inwardly, it will shift out. You were at R star, as money, as there was devaluation, money demand would go up, you will have a balance of payment surplus, but over time reserves would go up and whatever was the excess demand in the money market would be wiped out. Eventually, you will reach an equilibrium, where the reserves would go up to a level where, to a level which is R triple star. So, that is, that 
was the working when you had a fixed exchange rate regime. Now, think of a scenario where you have a flexible exchange rate. When you have a flexible exchange rate regime, can you think what will happen to this equation? This was a case of a fixed exchange rate. Now, you have a case of a flexible exchange rate regime. Now, we are trying to understand what happens uh, what does monetary approach to balance of payment has to say when you have a flexible exchange rate? Can you can you think what will happen to this r dot term? It will be 0 absolutely, because there is no question of having reserves when you have a flexible exchange rate regime, because uh, the any disequilibrium in the case of a flexible exchange rate regime is managed by the changes in the prices of the foreign exchange. So, this is an ideal situation, where you have a freely floating exchange rate. There is no question of any country uh, maintaining any reserves of foreign currency. So, r dot would be 0. In that case, you would see that the money demand would be equal to the money supply because r dot is 0. So, money demand will always be equal to the money supply. So, then flexible So, uh, so pi is flexible. So, money demand is equal to money supply, which is f r y k pi p star is equal to l s. So, pi is l s by k p star f r y. I replace the value of p star from the from the prices which prevail in the foreign country. Now, look at how I have derived p star, same way f r star y star p star 
this is the money demand function in the foreign country L star s, this is equal to k p star is equal to L star s, p star is L star s, k star f r star y star and the prices there is a weighted average of the imported good, the prices of the imported good there in the foreign country and the price of the domestic good. So, if you do it you, you will get k star p star. Okay. So, then if you put it here you will you will get all constant theta constant theta is k star f r star y star k f r y l s l star s l s l star s. What does it mean? If you increase the money supply in the economy and if you just recapitulate the what happens in your economy, if you increase money supply excess supply of money equivalent to excess demand for goods or and excess demand in the bonds market. So, you have a balance of payment de deficit and if it is a flexible exchange rate then your currency would your currency would depreciate or foreign currency would depreciate. If foreign money supply increases, can you think what will happen if foreign money supply increases? There will be an excess supply of money in their market, which is equivalent to saying that there is excess demand for uh, goods and bonds in their market. So, they will have a balance of payment deficit, uh, they would have a deficit and we will have a surplus. So, when we will have a surplus, our currency would appreciate, our currency would appreciate. So, that is why you have an inverse relationship between pi and L star s. Can I repeat this point again? Okay. Uh, when the their money supply increases, think same way that Walras law will hold. So, excess supply of money in their market, which is equivalent to saying excess demand for goods and securities in their market. So, excess demand for goods and securities in their market and this being a flexible exchange rate regime. If you have a balance of payment deficit, there is no question of losing reserves. They Their currency would depreciate, it is equivalent to our currency would depreciate. So, this is a function of L s L star s. So, now uh, please try to recall uh, some I think uh, you asked uh, very first day what determines sorry what determines the changes in the exchange rates right. So, now here at this moment up till now we have we have studied at least four factors which determine the changes in the exchange rate. One, the open interest parity says that pi hat is a function of the differential interest rates. Remember the open interest parity, which is pi hat the is equal to r minus r star. So, the this is the expected rate of change of exchange rate. So, the exchange rate moves because of the differential interest rates this coming from the open interest parity. Then uh, we studied the PPP theory, purchasing power parity theory and if you assume that whatever the monetary approach believes that this is a constant, then you would see that pi dot or the change in the exchange rate will be E dot by E or pi dot by pi where d pi by pi, this pi dot by pi is d pi by pi, okay, this is uh, d pi by pi, this is equal to p dot by p minus p dot star by p star. So, this d pi d p by p d p star by p star. So, your exchange rate moves because of the differential inflation rates. 
because of the differential interest rates, because of the differential money supply, because of uh, a factor called delta. Remember delta? Delta was when the foreign currency is in forward premium. Yeah, delta was if this was greater than 0, so pi f minus pi was greater than 0. So, pi f was greater than pi. So, you you would buy foreign currency at the spot market and sell it at a higher rate in the forward markets. But when you buy foreign currency in the spot market, it would lead to depreciation of your currency. Okay. So, then econometrically, you have all right hand side variables coming from the theory. So, this exercise you can do it as an exercise for uh, this research work that you need to do. You can consider any country. You can take on the left hand side the exchange rate, may be Indian rupee vis a vis SDR. SDR is the special drawing right, it is the money of the IMF. This on the left hand side and with the data that I have already sent that CEIC database you have data for all the countries. So, you need to take left hand side, you can download it in the excel sheet. Left hand side will be the exchange rate. On the right hand side, you can have the differential interest rates. So, you can consider foreign country to be say US. If you are working on China, then you can consider foreign country to be Japan, whatever. Uh, so, you can have a differential interest rate you can get data on the differential inflation rate, you can get data on the differential money supply, you can get data on the forward premium delta of the foreign currency. So, four factors. Then generally when you do this type of thing, then you also include uh, say y star output of uh, prevailing in the foreign country and output um, GDP of your own country. How is it linked to the exchange rate? Well, if the foreign GDPs go up, foreign incomes go up, the demand for money goes up, because higher the incomes, higher is the demand for money. There is excess demand for money in their market. So, if you um, assume that the Walras law holds, so if there is excess demand for money, there has to be an excess supply in the goods and the bond market. So, it would mean that you would have uh, uh, you would have uh, excess supply. So, you would have a surplus in their country. Surplus would mean that there th you would see an appreciation of the of their currency or a depreciation of our currency. Can you can you go over this link again? So, because their incomes are increasing, they have more demand for foreign goods. No, um, the link is through this. When their incomes go up, it's this. It's this in their country which is going up. So excess demand for money is equivalent to saying that there is excess supply in the goods and the bond market. So excess supply in the goods and the bond market would mean that their currency would appreciate excess supply. Remember excess supply in there, there you have a balance of payment surplus. So, if it is a flexible exchange rate, their currency would appreciate, our currency would depreciate. Okay, think of another way, uh, what happens if this goes up, our incomes go up. If our incomes go up, 
if our incomes go up, the demand for money goes up, there is excess demand for money, there is excess supply. So, you, you will see appreciation of our currency or depreciation of the foreign currency. So, it means that if you are taking incomes, this will come uh, and if you have an exchange rate on the left hand side, pi on the left side, this will come with a positive sign, this will come as a negative sign. So, it will be again y by y star, y by y star, oh sorry y star by y, y star by y. So, then, so, uh, so if you have to put an econometric equation, it will be l n pi a constant alpha plus beta log L s by L star s plus gamma log y star by y plus uh, m delta plus r uh, sorry q r minus r star plus s p minus p star plus u. And if you want to make it logs, you can add on q times log delta, q times log r minus r star s time log p minus p star. If you recall uh, econometric equation, they have these parameters. Each econometric equation will be identified by parameters alpha, beta, gamma, m, q, s. So, if you want to make it all logs, where the coefficients will give you the elasticity, you can do this exercise. You just have to take this and the logs log y star y, it is not difficult to get GDP data, not difficult to get money supply data, not difficult to get the forward premium, r minus r star, interest rates, inflation rates. And so, this will be the correct specification of this model. Anyone who takes any factor uh, will lead to incorrect specification, because this is what the theory is saying. It is not L star s by L s, it is L s by L star s, it is y star by y. Then if you are doing it for India, you can also consider, because our exchange rate moves, because the U s dollar moves. De facto, not by law, if you do an exercise like this and if you put U s dollars on the right hand side you will see that U s dollar will have a significant impact on the exchange rate. If you consider all these variables with U s dollars, you will see the role of dollar to have a role of dollar, this, this factor will have a significant impact on the exchange rates. And then when, if you work out standardized beta coefficients, that means make each variable as standardized variable 0, 1 put every factor on the same platform and then compare the relative effects, you will see that that exchange rate U s dollar plays a significant role in what the Indian rupee, how the Indian rupee moves. Okay. So, uh, we do not say that uh, by law that we move according to what U s dollar moves, but if you do this exercise, you will find it. I mean, it is up to you. I mean, it is it's, it's the researcher's job to find out what determines India's exchange rate. Indian, how does Indian rupee move? Rupee versus uh, rupee versus SDR. So, when you take that exchange rate, it will not be in terms of US dollars, because your, if you put US dollars here, it has to be in context of something, like rupees in terms of US dollars. But if you have take, if you are taking rupee in terms of US dollars, you cannot take US dollars here. You have to take US doll, 
US dollar in context of SDR, Indian rupee in context of SDR, special drawing rights that is the IMF money. So, then you can put US dollars, you can put Japanese yen, you can put Euro, Australian dollar, Japanese yen, Chinese renminbi. You can have all these factors and you can have these factors and then it will be an interesting exercise. Do it, you, you will get an equation which you can also use for forecasting what will be the value of Indian rupee after an, in, after an year's time. So, you can put the values of the right hand side variables in that regression equation and you can estimate what will be the exchange rate after say a month or an year and so on. Yeah. When the incomes are increasing, we are saying the savings are increasing through the money demand. No, when we say that the incomes are increasing, we are relating it to the money demand. I say the savings are up. Yeah, the savings go up. And so, we have a balance of savings. By payment surplus, surplus consumption. consumption goes down. Yes. So, if consumptions are increasing, then balance of payment deficit would come into picture. No, so, yeah, yeah. See, um, when we are talking of this monetary approach to balance of payments, uh, when we say that the savings go up and the consumption goes down, we, we are saying that C plus S is equal to Y, is not it? So, when savings go up, it is the same argument that in the Keynesian model, remember the savings paradox, what was that savings paradox in the Keynesian model? If the savings goes up, instead of income going up, the income goes down. This is a question which was regularly asked when uh, you were discussing the Keynesian model, reason being that in the Keynesian model, if the savings goes up, the consumption goes down, the aggregate demand goes down, it pulls down the income through the multiplier. That was the famous savings paradox. This is all coming from there only. Is that Keynesian model uh, is an extension of what they have been saying, that increase uh, in savings. Um, reduces income, but, but the fact is that we are trying to relate incomes with savings. Yeah. So, the relation here in the monetary approach is that incomes tend to have an impact on the money demand okay. and money demand tends to have an impact on the savings. So, the consumption goes down. So, so what is your question then? Yeah, so, uh, so in the monetary approach, this, this is the equation, it is not relating anything with the, with the consumption, right. So, uh, if you recall the how we got this equation, y was equal to c plus i plus g minus t, uh, g plus x minus m. This was assumed to be 0 in this approach and this was c plus s plus t is equal to c plus i plus g plus x minus m. This was 0, this was equal to this c and c cancels. So, you get c is equal to x minus m. So, any current account surplus was a function of savings only. It is based on very stringent assumptions this monetary approach. So, when we come to the next chapter that is the asset market approach, we will see some flexibility. It will be more refined, output will not be at full employment level, prices will not be a function of the exchange rates, uh, all in markets would be interlinked. You will see all these changes coming up in, in the next approach. So, this is very stringent, it has this equation only. So, it is this linkage which works here. But that is how the asset market approach came in, because people started questioning that 
it is based on very stringent assumptions. So, when we come and discuss the portfolio balance approach, you will see that you will have a portfolio, where you will have money, you will have domestic bonds, you will have foreign bonds, you will see that there will be savings, you will see that you will have a wealth, wealth is income from all sources, whether productive, non-productive. And then all sort of equations, uh, which will change, so it will be a mix of everything, it will be more nearer to the reality, rather than based on all these assumptions. Okay, that is interesting. I am glad that you reminded me. Remember, uh, the when we were discussing the Don Bush model, we discussed that the story does not end, uh, when, when you increase the money supply and it is a flexible exchange rate. right? And uh, with the, we, had, we had said that, if you, the story does not end, if you assume that the prices are flexible. If prices are not flexible, Remember, when you increase money supply, what happens? L m curve shifts to the right, R goes down, incomes go up. So, imports go up, balance, there is a balance of payment deficit. If there is a balance of payment deficit, it is a flexible exchange rate. L m curve shifts to the right, but when there is a balance of payment deficit, the I s curve shifts to the right also. So, monetary policy is completely effective in the case of flexible exchange rate with fixed prices. But when you have flexible prices, see what happens, uh, when you have flexible prices, look at m by p ratio. m has gone up, but now prices start increasing. When the prices start increasing, the L m curve shifts to the, shifts slowly shifts, starts shifting to the left. You will see an appreciation of the currency. So, that when you had increased the money supply, the, the exchange rate had overshot its target, but because of the appreciation, it comes back to its equilibrium. Now, that you, uh, you can think even in the Mandel framing framework, that, but then you have to add on that the prices are flexible. Okay. Now, if you want to bring in the same thing in this approach, then you have to concentrate on this particular equation or, or this one, which is pi p star by p. So, say for example, again think that in this monetary approach to balance of payment, money supply goes up. So, if the money supply goes up, interest rates go down, incomes go up. If incomes go up, there is a balance of payment deficit. If there is a balance of payment deficit, and it is a flexible exchange rate, this goes up. But now, please think that, uh, please see that this is a stringent assumption, that this is a constant. If this is a constant, then something has to happen in this model. Can you tell me, what will be that something, which will happen, which will make it constant? The prices will go up. And remember, in the uh, Mandel Fleming framework, I deliberately made an assumption saying that the prices uh, were first constant and then they change. Here it, you see pi changing, you see p changing. So, this does not change, real exchange rate does not change. So, then that money supply which increased, you do not see uh, any change in the I s curve in the monetary approach. Only when the prices go up, the L m curve which shifted to the right will come back to its equilibrium position. There will be no shift in the I s curve. So, that is the difference between the final results are the same, but the approach is little different, because here they relate to the P P P. So, I am glad that you questioned me on that. Yeah. Okay, so, we will end up here, and uh, we will see a more refined model uh, on the asset market approach to balance of payment. Uh, that is also called the portfolio balance approach to the balance of payment.